Thank you, Venerable Chair Dee. I'm happy to see everybody again. This closes out our first week tonight. We all get a little break. <laughs> um, before I started, I wanted to share a, a little bit with you this uh, same kind of series uh, we had two years ago, which was then a call, like we called it the introduction to the study of Buddhism. And uh, with the help of Glenn and Venerable J.G., as well as with Jane Iwamura, the chair of the religion department, and Chris Danny Fisher, who's head of the chaplaincy program, uh, they've done a wonderful job with the help also of John Fries, <coughs> Venerable Duh. They've taken that course and put it onto a DVD, and they've made a reader to go with it very nice. It's articles and things that go with those lecture series. Uh, we've done this because on Sunday we've been given permission to start using this to teach a course in the California State Prisons. So I'm going to go on Sunday to Calipatria down in the hands of Borrego Desert to start using this material they will be watching the lectures in their library and their TV set through this means. They'll write papers based on the readers. So we're trying to develop a, a very active program of prison classes. So any of you who are ever interested thought you might like to know what we're doing with some of the work that you see here in a classroom. We have it on the internet. We also try to expand it to these sorts of multiple uses. And uh, I really appreciate the help that everybody's given on this. Thank you very much. Well, tonight it's, again, emptiness. You would think we'd run out of things, but as I said last night, one of the things that the Buddhists have to revisit all the time is to say, it, it has to be the emptiness of everything, or it it doesn't work at all. So therefore, you've got to have many examples where you take the process and s make sure that it's understood that that aspect is also empty. And before you know it, we humans love to have things that are not empty, so we're always looking for one counterexample. And the Buddhists are continually remind us that no counterexample will work. So that's why I take these multiple things where we're talking about emptiness in terms of time and place or space tonight. As Venerable J.G. just said in the introduction, um, in the Vajrachedika, that is the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha turns to Subhuti. Um, Subhuti is a major figure in the Prajaparamita literature. Uh, he doesn't play a role much in the Pali Canon. His name is mentioned, but it's, he's not a big issue. In the Prajaparamita, he's the main person. So Subhuti uh, is asked a question by the Buddha. The Buddha says, do you think you can measure the space in the Eastern Quarter? And of course, it's a, it's a question where the answer is already known. He's not asking for information. <laughs> he is testing Subhuti. And of course, Subhuti comes through in admirable fashion. And he says, no, I don't think so. And it, he then says, well, what about the rest of the directions? Can you measure them? Subhuti again passes the test. No, you can't. It seems like a very simple question, but the implications of it are enormous. If you say that there is no end to something, endlessness, then you have already made a, a statement about the nature of reality, which has implications in every area of life and in everything that we say. If it's true that you cannot measure the eastern direction, then that says 
that you can never know exactly what's at the end of it, because there is none. And that also is the reason why the Buddhists say you can never find the first cause. Where endlessness exists, there can be no first cause. You just keep finding there's something else and something else and something else. You are never able to draw the parameters. We can look out on the world around us and we see a horizon. But it's a false horizon. It's only a horizon because of our perspective. But we know as we move toward that horizon, a new one appears, and a new one, and a new one. So that just from the very first question that the Buddha asked Sabuti, you basically have the lecture for tonight. So if you want to go home now, you can go. <laughs> you are sure. There is no limit to any of the spaces. We are still dealing with this in our science and in everything that we do in terms of trying to discover the nature of the universe. We've made enormous strides in terms of the scientific understanding, or what we hope to be the understanding, of the mechanism of how the universe as we see it came into existence. So the question that's often asked is, does the universe have an infinite past? If it has an infinite past, then you can have no first cause. In other words, that is the place where the Buddhists have long said there is an infinite past. So the question which some people have asked, was there something before the Big Bang? And I'm always surprised when a lot of scientists say, no, there was nothing. But um, I think that what they're beginning to learn from, say, the Bose work in, in CERN in Switzerland is, in fact, the continuum that exists has had all kinds of activities. So the Buddhists long ago decided if there's one universe, there are probably multiple universes. They had already conceived the idea of multiverses. Now, scientists today would say there may be multiverses, but probably we can never see them nor even find them. They are too huge. They may not be that far away from us in terms of the measurements that you have in a cosmic level. Some people have even said that the next universe is one atom's width away from us in terms of the brain, as they call it. We're just now beginning to try to figure this out. Where does the universe come from? When does it start? Is there a starting point? Is there an ending point? Is it going to expand forever? It's expanding rapidly. Will that expanse slow down? And that's what they once thought. They thought, aha, there's a big explosion. Well, we know that when there's an explosion, it, it expands rapidly, and then it slows down, and finally, the expansion stops it's not slowing down. The expansion may even be speeding up. This says we have to rearrange our thinking about the nature of this explosion that we are part of. We are just particles in that explosion. And we are in this expanding universe. It always amazes me when you, when you look at the starry sky through one of the, those wonderful new telescopes like the Hubble, and you see this little point of light in this one universe, and then they tell you that has maybe a trillion stars and planets in it. That, that's not just a little dot of light. That's just a portal to another whole cosmic realm, almost. 
this one universe is absolutely huge. It's beyond my comprehension. I can't even put my mind around it. I can't even conceive of how it is. But we're living in this space. And the question is, what is the nature of the space in which we live? What causes it? What is it like? It's essential to us in one way to understand that that is the nature of everything that we do and everything that we use. We have to understand space and consequently we have to understand time. So seeing, we look at this vastness of this cosmos. The Buddhists use the word akashadatu, the space element. Space, whatever is out there. And we, we know that if I try to understand it, I need to know distance and I need to have some sense of size. But if it's endless, I can't know distance really. At least I can't know whether it's long or short distance. Because what I might at one time call a short distance may at another level be very long. Or what I think to be a long distance, as my idea of the universe expands, it turns out that what I thought was long is just one tiny little speck in the whole of it. And from another perspective, it's small. Long and short are, are just our own conceptual things that we press upon the reality of space. We just put it out there. That's how we think. That's how we have to think. What's so amazing to me and what I still, I have to tell you, I don't really understand is I can look through the telescope and see light that is 12 billion years old. It's taken 12 billion years for that light to come and hit the telescope. And I, I'm, I then realized that time has, has turned itself back on me. I'm looking at 12 billion years ago but where was the explosion 12 billion years ago that I'm only now seeing it? In other words, we are constantly being presented with the fact that time and space as we have known them are very hard to pin down and to understand. The boundless space, the Buddhists call it ajatakasa, the boundless space. From the Yogacara Sutra, it says, nothing makes sense without some kind of substratum. We talked about that a little last night with Mavanga, in terms of mental substratum, when you have thought. From the Buddhists, they would say that they think of space as being a plenum. That space is filled. It is, it is sometimes called the Dharma Dhatu. Dharma means, sometimes means thing. A dharma can be a thing. It can also be a mental state. It can be many, many definitions, and as we found out last night, many definitions mean, of course, it has no meaning unless we put it with something else. When you put the Dharma with space itself, then the Buddhists call that a plenum. It's filled with this thing which is like we were talking about the color in a peacock feather, which only exists when the right conditions of light strike it, and otherwise the feather is black. The plenum is there only when the conditions are right to show it to us. 
and it's not there if we don't have those conditions in the same sense. So I live in a world, I have a compass. I have always loved compasses. And the very idea that somehow you could have in your hand this little toy almost that would always point north. It just amazed me that north was such a reality that even this thing I'm holding in my hand would always go to it. So I grew up thinking north is really important. Without north, I don't know where I am. How is it that north became the way in which we find ourselves? So if, if the, this little instrument points to it, it must be something, right? It's pointing to something. So I felt that north was really up there. And I was very happy that it was up there when I was really young because, of course, Santa Claus was there, and I love that. <laughs> and I would look at my compass and say, I know where Santa is. <laughs> this toy I got under the Christmas tree tells me exactly where he is. He's north. But what is north? Where is north? The compass is pointing to the geomagnetic north, if you will. But it never stays in the same place. The North Pole is moving around all the time. The South Pole is moving around. And not only do they move around, but now from the ancient rocks, people have finally discovered that periodically throughout geological ages, the two simply reverse. The North Pole becomes the South Pole. So they found these magnetic rocks that where the compass should be pointing north, it's pointing south. Why? Because the North Pole changed. And people say we might be due for another one of these. <laughs> I don't know what it means to us to have the magnetic reversal. We know it does occur. It probably, I don't think I have probably to worry about it too much at my age, but some of you are really young. You might once in a while have a sleepless night over whether the balls are going to reverse on you. So when I say I'm pointing north, the point is moving all the time. There's, there's no fixed north. I think of it as fixed, but in fact, it's not. And that's partly what we say about most of the things which we measure and which we take, as I did as a child, I was absolutely sure that my compass was pointing to a real thing. And it was a fixed thing, and it stayed fixed. And if it didn't stay fixed, I was in trouble if I went out and used my compass to take a hike because I would use that fixed point and say, as long as I go north, I'm going to get there. Or if I go south, I'll get back home. I had to trust that it was a fixed point. But from another angle, in a way, it worked. Many things work. and. So they're pragmatically OK to use them, but they're not real. That fixed point was moving the whole time I was growing up. That pole never stayed where I thought it did. It was up there moving around, and it's still moving. And if I had a compass right now, it would point somewhere differently than it would have pointed when I was a child. So when we say that north, south, east, west are real things we can absolutely identify, how? What is our point of view? We're just having some friends who are joining us from Australia. As a child, I used to look at the globe and think, 
what would it be like to go to Australia and be upside down? <laughs> I really thought I would be upside down. I mean, why wouldn't I be? Because it's un down under, we say. But of course, when you're there, you're, you don't feel upside down. <laughs> and you aren't. What's up and down? In space, there's no up and down. How, how, why do we say up and down? It's a convention. The words themselves, we think, have meaning, but they don't. They really don't have any meaning at all in space. Space doesn't care whether it's north, south, east, or west. It makes no difference whatever. It makes no difference whether you're on this side of a sphere, or that side, or this side, or that side. No side of the sphere is up or down. So endlessness means that no pattern can be complete. So that's why the Amitabha Sutra says, one eon in this world is only a day and night in Amitabha's Buddha's land of bliss. The length of time the, the, in, a, in a boundless space has, has no meaning whatever. It is complete, space is completely empty of any meaning and endlessness. It just cannot be defined. Every time you define it, the next moment it's destroyed because the, the, the space goes on and on. So that's why they have, you know, they do the mathematics and they say, mathematically, there's, there's 98 point eight something percent chance, and maybe even higher, that there's another place, another universe in the endlessness, which is an exact duplicate of this one. Mathematically, it's possible. In other words, mathematically, anything is possible in endlessness. You just keep looking and looking, and it's endless. Eventually, mathematically, you would come to something which is identical. It doesn't say it would ever be, but mathematically, it, it's the probability becomes higher because in endlessness, there's no end. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. And you can look forever. <laughs> and somewhere in the forever, you don't know what you're going to find. Maybe nothing, but you, you, mathematically, it's just an issue. At the moment when the Big Bang occurred, it's called singularity. And I forgot, I think they said 33 seconds. For 33 seconds of the Big Bang, there was singularity which said that time and space were not present. Singularity is there was no way to distinguish anything from anything else. It was all singular. It was like we talked about color. It's all white. There's no other color to give you form. That was something which I think the Buddhists would call the completeness of conditions. There was the completeness of the condition of singularity. There was no way to distinguish at those 33 seconds. Then suddenly, and this is why the Higgs boson is, has attracted so much attention, suddenly the singularity was broken. The asymmetry of the universe started, and matter appeared. And once any particle of matter occurred, you have space. It exists within a locus. And with space comes time. You can now measure the distance between two points of matter. And at that moment, time and space as we know them began to occur. 
So when we say that you can never find the beginning of time, in one sense what the scientists deal with with the Big Bang is to say, from one perspective we can absolutely date when space as we know it in this universe started and when time as we know it in this universe started in the sense of measurable. That's all it means. Can you measure it? We're always looking, and this is something which everybody has been trying for a long time. We, we want to know what is this space-time continuum because from that Big Bang moment until the present, we have had space and we have had distance between things and we've had measurability, and with measurability, we've been able to deal with time. So it's just been a continuum from that point on. But then everybody in physics has wanted to know a general theory. Is there something that ties it all together where you have the same laws that apply everywhere? And poor old Einstein, you know, he died saying, I'm a failure. I never found a general theory. I never was able to determine why certain things occur at a quantum level and other things occur at the material level. I could never find any way to make a continuum between them. He was, and he said, but I can't believe that God plays tricks on us and would create something that has multiple laws, there must be somewhere where there's a law that applies to everything. He never found it. So, in physics, what happens at the quantum level is that present cannot be essentially different from the past or the future. In the quantum, the past and future are as real as the present. And to understand it makes your brain hurt. If you don't, a lot of physicists. <laughs> it's just incredible. But basically, it says that this division into past, present, and future at the quantum level simply doesn't work. Because they all three are able to emerge at any given moment. And that's beyond my comprehension, I have to tell you. But there was no general rule that Einstein could find as to why that happens there, but it doesn't happen in my life. In my life, there is a past, and there's the present, and there's a not yet come future. So I feel there are three distinct things. And yet, they're telling me that at the root of my being, that, that those three don't exist, or they're interchangeable. <laughs> what, where is the same thing we're talking about with the North? I really felt that I understand there's past, and there's present, and there's future. You take that away from me, and you take away North, South, East, and West, I'm not sure where I am. Time is very hard to define. What is time? It is simply a measure of the numerical order of change. That's all it is. That's what time is. No matter how you deal with time, that's what it comes down to every, every, every time. <laughs> there is no way to have any concept of time as some kind of entity. It is merely a, a way in which we measure and have numerical occurrence and order. And we call that time. That's all we, we just all agree we're going to use that word time for this numerical order of change. Then the question is, are time and space then separated from the mind? If my mind has to measure and deal with it in order for it to be time, then is there some kind of time separate from my mind? Am, 
is my brain free of time? Or is it that time and space are purely constructs, mental constructs, which we are placing on the plenum, the all? Now, we're told that all the Buddhas of the three times, the Buddhas say that, past Buddhas, present Buddhas, future Buddhas, all the Buddhas of the three times, they speak of the three times, have relied upon the perfections. And because of that, they have found full, perfect enlightenment. Then the Prajaparabhita says, ha, but Subhuti, the past mind cannot be grasped, neither can the present mind or the future mind. So where is this full, perfect enlightenment of the Buddhas in the three times? There's no way for me to find out where they are. One of the ways they describe this is, I use the analogy of a new car. I get a new car and I love it. And I love its smell and I know the thump of the door and the quietness when the windows are up. And then after about 15 years, I began to complain about this old car. And it's rattling and it's not doing right. And then I say to myself, when? did it become old? It's like Don and I were talking. When did we become old? Exactly what moment do you pass where you can say, now the car is old, now I'm old? You can never find such a point. Why is that? Because it's merely conceptual. What the use of that word is merely a concept which we construct. So we have to, we define what it is by hindsight. We have 20-20 vision. We look back upon our life and we say, well, I was once young and then I was middle-aged and <laughs> gulp, now I'm old. So we deal with these concepts. <clears throat> Time is, is an order of event. That's all it is. It has no other existence. So a lot of people say time is motion in space. And we see that motion or we, in, we conceptualize that motion and therefore time for us is just a way of conceptualizing it. So I say I can see the present. However, uh, there are times when I have double vision, <laughs> and the present doesn't look as, as clear as I once thought it did. And that's because when I'm looking out at you, what my brain tells me is the present moment of, I see you. But of course, by the time I say that, it's already passed. So am I experiencing only you in the past? But what is the you I'm experiencing? To call what I'm seeing you takes a lot of conceptualization. I have separated you from me, but I don't see much of me. I just see a few little dots, and if I look down, I can see my legs or something. But for the most part, I don't see me. I see you. How much time has passed? What is the duration of time? And we all have the old thing. It depends on what's happening to you as to how long you experience time. If you've got your finger on a hot stove, time passes pretty fast. One second is a long time. Two seconds is sheer agony, and three seconds, you're, you're finished. But if I have a vacation and I go to Hawaii and I only have four days, it's like, but I only got here. How does I have to pack and go catch the airplane? Where did the four days go? It's conceptual. It's just my concept that's dealing with the long and short. So since 
<clears throat> time is only measured by space, the question is, what would be the most precise measurement of time that you could possibly conceive of? And they've said the most, so far, the most precise thing we can think of is to look at the cesium atom, look at the cycles of radiation from it, which are many. There are billions that are happening every few seconds. And you measure the distance between those cycles. If that's what an atomic clock is, um, I always feel very inadequate when I go to see my brother because he has a clock on his wall that's connected through the internet to the atomic clock. So if you ever want to know what time it is, his clock is right, right up to the, as close as we can come because it's, it adjusts itself according to this. And as he's told me many times, it may be off one second every 30 million years. It's that accurate. So this poor old watch of mine that ticks a lot is so clumsy and so inaccurate that in one sense when I say this is the time, I have no idea what the real time is down to that limitation. But the measurement for time is space, always. It's the space between the cycles. We use space, and without space, we have no way to measure time. We have sun time, one year. How long it takes us to go around the sun. We have moon time. How long it takes the cycle of the moon. And we have an earth time which is the rotation of a day. All of those are measurements of space. Without space, none of those make any sense. They're all spatial. So that the time we live by is always spatial. <clears throat> so we have circular time. That is, it just keeps repeating. The moon cycles repeat. The sun cycles, repeat, the daily thing. They all are repetitive cycles. But we also mark by seasons. We've stopped doing that to some degree. However, who knows what today is? Yes, what is summer solstice? What, it's the longest day. Today, for most people who measure by season, this is a really special day. We will have the longest bit of sunlight today that we're going to have for the entire year. This is the time if you're in northern Sweden tonight, there's no night. People stay up 24 hours a day today because the sun never sets, or if it does, it dips down for about two minutes and then it's back up. We realize that humans have, from the earliest period, known about this time and have measured it. Stonehenge, for example, in England, that famous thing, they finally decided that it's basically built to show when summer solstice arrives. Because the sun will rise between two stones on that day. And that tells you where you are in the seasonal cycle. I was in Australia recently and I read that they have discovered a what they think to be a 30,000 year old circle of stones that are arranged so that the heel stone in that circle is summer solstice. It's amazing that humans found summer solstice to be so important that they build these enormous structures in order to remind people this is the summer solstice. This is the seasonal. And that you must measure the seasonal as well as the circular. Seasonal is circular too. We do it with, you know, our big holiday is Christmas. 
there is no question in anybody's mind that Christmas is because of winter solstice. The calendar's off. It really should be the 21st of December. That's the darkest night of the year when the light starts returning. That's what all the people in Northern Europe were celebrating. That's when they brought the trees in with lights on them. Well, these are all pagan, if you will. They have nothing to do with anything other than the ancient pagan traditions of seasonal adjustments of time. When does the light come back? In a way, from today on, we're going to lose light. The days will now grow shorter. And this, this is something we'll, we'll discuss in a minute, which is ritual time. Circular time we have to look at because circular time says nothing lasts forever. The Mayan calendar, we recently got very worried because the Mayan calendar came to, that we have came to an end on December, what was it, 22nd last year. The Mayan calendar finished and everybody decided that the world was going to come to an end and great, that was the end of time that the, the Mayans somehow knew. Other people said, that's just a cycle. We're now in the next cycle. They would have known that the next cycle was coming. I have to say, I really admire the people who have deciphered the Mayan, out, Mayan text. They are text. The pictures are actually text. And there was particularly one woman scholar in, in Texas People treated her poorly for a long time because she said, these are more than calendars. These are texts that talk about people. They all said, no, no, you've got it wrong, it can't be. But by golly, she stuck to her guns and she proved that the pictures represent sounds. And if you make those sounds it's a history. Amazing on her part to be able to reconstruct the ancient language and to see that a certain image on these so-called calendrical things tell a story. We have deep time. You go out there and dig archaeologically. You can do it in your own backyard. The minute you dig down, you're going through time. And the farther down you go, the farther down in time you are. Um, I will never do any of this digging because three years ago, I helped my son in the vineyards up in Napa County dig a hole for a project he had and I inhaled a fungus that made me very sick for a long time. Uh, so I've been told, do not be an archeologist. It will kill you, you're susceptible. Anytime you see somebody digging a hole that's three feet deep, you must run the other direction. So believe me, I do. Uh, I've given up deep time. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn that over to all of you. No more deep time for me. <laughs> you know, for years, people could not figure out the longitude of where you were on the Earth's surface. They knew latitude. They could get that from sightings. They never knew where they were in terms of longitude. So Columbus didn't know where he was on the globe. Most sailors didn't know where they were. People would die at sea because they thought they were one place and they were way out in the sea and they didn't, they didn't know where they were. So there was a big offer. They offered, at the time, a huge offer, $50,000 for anybody who could tell, help sailors know about longitude. The simplest solution and the person who developed it, it made great sense, but he wasn't given the prize. He had to divide it with the scientists at Oxford and Cambridge who said, if you do this complicated 
analysis of the stars and the constellations, you can also find out pretty much where you are on the surface of the Earth, but it may take you two or three days. They won half the prize for that. But he said it's very simple. You get a clock, you set it for Greenwich time in England, and you keep that clock running on your ship, and you always know what time it is at Greenwich. So when you spot exactly at noon where you are, and you know what time it is at Greenwich, you know where you are in the world. Because you know how, where the time is all the way around the world, otherwise you couldn't set Greenwich time. So all you have to know is what time it is there and what time it is where you are, and you do the equation, and you will know exactly your lunch too. It was a remarkably easy thing, and it was one that was used until GPS on, on, on almost all ships. Forget this doing the stars. Too difficult. All you have to do is just have a Greenwich time and spot it at noon, your time, and you know where you are. Absolutely know where you are. GPS, of course, has taken us into another whole realm of spatial designation, which is really wonderful, and I love it, but this is where we have. So the question about time, is it, is it a single direction flow? Does time just go from here to there? Or is time warped by space? And that's what people have said, that the idea of time as a straight arrow is not the case. Time is warped. It doesn't move like we thought it did. But we have many ways of measuring time. Our concepts of time are, are, we have religious time and we have secular time. If we look at time through the religious things, we can, for example, have a study of the last days of the earth, of the world. Eschatology, it's called. The world's going to come to an end. We know that, so we're going to study it and we're going to try to find out exactly when is it coming. Well, we know periodically somebody figures it out and then everybody is around waiting for the end of time to come. And usually they have to pack up and go home because it hasn't come and they've got to wait and they have to refigure. And tomorrow somebody will have refigured it and say, well, I've got the answer now. I know when it's going to come. And people will, will gather to do that. But ritual time is circular. Ritual time is very interesting because you do a ritual and it starts, but ritual time reaches an apex and then it declines. So a Brahmin gets up early in the morning by the Ganges so that the sun will rise. And if you say, what would happen if you didn't come here and do this? And they say, the sun wouldn't rise. And we say, well, how do you know? And they say, well, we know because we've been doing this forever and the sun always rises. So therefore we know we've got to keep doing it, otherwise the sun won't rise. But the ritual to bring the sun up is only functions till noon. After noon the ritual begins to decline. And finally the sun disappears again. The ritual it's like a juggling thing. It can hold it up for only so long, and then it has to be repeated. The ritual constantly has to be redone. And that's why in, in the circular time of yugas in India, the ritual that starts one will only last a certain period, and now we're in the decline of the present yuga, they say. Days are shortening. Time is not as long as it used to be. People aren't living to be as old. There aren't thousand-year-old people. Although, I, I began to think, well, maybe it's not quite so bad because you see these big signs now put up by an insurance company that says there is a person alive today who will live to be 150. Some baby somewhere with all the stuff that's going on, could possibly live to be 150, already alive. 
So I'm not sure that the yuga is quite as bad as they once said it was. Time as a deity, uh, time is seen as vicious. Time is a, is a, is Mahakala is demonic. Why? Because it's time that tears you to pieces. It's time that makes you old. It's time that destroys everything that you buy and every new car. Kala is out there eating it up all the time and it's becoming old because Mahakala is a, is a, is a demonic side of time. On the other hand, because Mahakala is so demonic, if you want a good protector, he's about as good as you can get. Everybody's scared of time. So therefore, you better make good friends with Mahakala because you want a good protector, he's it. More demonic, the best. And so consequently, in the Tibetan art in particular, we see these wonderful Mahakalas which people want to have around, they want them on their walls, they want to do the rituals because of protection. The demonic is very protective. The biggest argument in, in Buddhism is the biggest debate in one way is between the Sarvastivadins and perhaps the Mahayanas. The Sarvastivadins say the three times exist. The dharmas are eternal in the continuum. Prajnaparamita says, time only exists dependent on cause and conditions, therefore it's empty of a real existence. So people look at the Sarvastivadins and say, you know, this is a kind of naive realism. Past, present, future, we, we are far beyond that. We don't believe that anymore. But I think it's a misunderstanding of what the Sarvastivadins said. In many ways, we really need to go back and re-look at that debate because they are probably the most insightful of all the Buddhists with regard to time. And it behooves all of us in Buddhist studies to go back and look at them very carefully. That is, they're saying that the total existence of everything happens in a changeless, timeless moment. And that moment is all three times existing. So Dhamma Jyoti is, is a wonderful uh, scholar who's done the best work on the Sarvastivada. If you want to read anything, read his book on, on the Abhidharma of the Sarvastivada. Wonderful book. And he, he says that the fearlessness which they depict that is, the ability to be in this world without fear is really what is described by these people in terms of the three times. Those times are just with us all the time. It's not that they are divisible as such, but that they are there. I think the Sarvastivadins come closest to quantum time of any of the Buddhists and that they need to be studied just for that reason. So that when we look at time, we have various forms. We have what's called presentism, which is that there's only the present time and nothing else. That's all we have. And there's reality to that. There's the possibilism, which is that the past and present, the past has existed and the present exists, so that that's true. But eternalism, in one sense, which is against the Buddhist tradition in a lot of ways, that word wouldn't be used, is that what's called past, present, and future are all existing within the block at one moment. They call it eternalism, but it's a misnomer in my view. It, it's just like saying those three times are always there conditions are right, any one of them will pop up. And I can only have past time when I have a concept of present time. That's when past time comes into my thinking. I can only have the future time when I have a, thinking about a past time and I say, well, that happened then, but I think tomorrow will be better. <laughs> 
we create these times in the ways in which we think. So long and short mean almost nothing. But they certainly tried to figure out ways to deal with the fact that all of these things are endless and are huge. So they gave, when they said the Mahakalpa, it's the longest time period that's ever been given a name. The Mahakalpa, if you figure it out, is 1.28 trillion years. And there's a name for that time. <laughs> so you get a silo that's filled with grain. So they say, in order to do a, a, one of these Mahakalpas, you count every grain that's in that big silo and you empty it. And then you take every grain and put it back in the silo one by one and count them. And then you empty it again and you do this a million times and you may have come close to counting a kalpa, a maha kalpa. So that was what they were after. So part of the nature of our thought about time and place is these three issues. From one point of view, we think subject and object. That's me and my past with my little compass. I was the subject, I had an object, and it told me something. But when you begin to realize that there's no subject, really, and there's no object, that, that the distinction being made between them is just a concept rather than a reality, then you have Paratantra. And finally, what you come to from all of this is where everything is emptiness. So they do it with a crystal, where you have a rose and you've got a crystal ball. You look at the rose and that's parikalpita. It's an object and there's a subject. But then the rose is reflected in the crystal ball. So when you look at the reflection in the crystal ball, then the subject and the object relationship has disappeared because you're really not looking at the rose itself anymore. You're seeing a reflection. It's only an indirect thing now. It's not a direct one-to-one -one relationship. And that it's when you realize that when you're looking at the rose and the crystal ball that everything is empty because it depends on the circumstance and it depends on the lens and the way in which you see it. So perception and time it are closely tied to each other. For example, if you look at your feet, your eyes will tell your brain about where your foot is much faster than when you press your foot against the ground and feel it, by the time that gets to your brain, it's much slower than seeing your foot. We're getting different perceptions of where our foot is. <clears throat> I'm very aware of this. I have peripheral neuropathy, which means my foot is numb. I can't trust the impression of my foot to tell me where it is. I have to see it. So at night, it's hard for me to walk because I'm not getting enough data. Mm, I have to look down and see, where is my foot? <laughs> Once my brain sees where my foot is, it's fine. It knows exactly what to do. So our visual and tactile sensations are, are very real things, but we don't normally have to deal with them. So time, like everything, it's a flash of lightning, a drop of dew. It's, even nirvana is like a magical illusion, a mirage. Any concept that we have, anything that we conceive of, it all plays into the same thing of it's, we are not able to find the reality behind. It's empty in that sense. It's the constant emptiness. So that time and space are like a dream. They're like bubbles of water. You can never tie down what's long and short. You can never tie down what's present, past, and future. 
you're never able to have that wonderful moment of having them all together. And so when the Buddha asked Subhuti, do you think the space in the eastern quarter could be measured? It was a question of enormous consequence, of enormous consequence. It wasn't just a playful little thing about, it had to do with the whole way in which we conceive, how we count, how we measure, what we think is the reality of the world. And that's why I've given this lecture to say, just like what we talked about last night with words, space and time, when you really begin to work and analyze them, have the same nature of emptiness. They are conceptualizations which, when we really begin to explore them, how can there, the only way I can measure precise time is the cycles of radiation from an atom. Is that a real thing which has a lot of meaning for me? So we are having to come to grips with the fact. Now I know my compass wasn't exact. Now I know that time on my watch is not exact. I have to live with the emptiness of the precision which I thought once existed, and now I know there is no precision at all. Okay, thank you. Thank you.